Welcome to the Strategy Skills Podcast. My name is Chris Safarova. I'm your host. I am a founder and CEO of firmsconsulting.com and strategytraining.com. Joining us today is Simon Mannerin. Simon is a New York Times bestselling author and founder and CEO of We First, leading brand consultancy that provides strategy, content, and training to accelerate growth through purpose. Simon, thank you for joining us on the Strategy Skills Podcast. Thanks. A pleasure to be here, Chris. Simon, so let's talk a little bit about what you have been doing. Given your cool Australian accent, I guess you are originally from Australia. Can you give us a highlight reel of your career? What led you to what you are doing today? Well, thank you. And I'm always mystified that the Australian accent is considered cool, but I'll take it. So thank you. And, you know, I was born in Sydney and grew up in Sydney and studied at Sydney University and did fine arts and law and then went into the advertising business and had some early success. So I went over to London and worked at agencies like Saatchi and Saatchi and Liga Stellani and then eventually came across to the United States when I started working at Wyden and Kennedy, Nike's advertising agency, and was lucky enough to work on those athletes that we all know and projects like the Olympics and World Cup. And then finally, I was uh, came down to Los Angeles where I live now uh, when I was worldwide creative director for Motorola. And so, you know, like many Australians, you travel around the world looking for different versions of success. And that took me to Los Angeles. And, you know, even after that sort of 15 years of being on staff at these great ad agencies, I actually still felt unfulfilled. I didn't know what it was, but there was something that I was, I felt was missing from my work. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened around that time that, you know, I read a speech that Bill Gates gave at the World Economic Forum, his creative capitalism speech, where he said, the private sector needs to play a bigger role in social change, especially because, you know, in 2007, 2008, we'd seen the global economic meltdown. And so I spent three years writing a book called We First, and, you know, that really started my company. And for the last 10 years, I've been very, very focused on building, accelerating growth and impact for a lot of companies that you would know. And my big purpose or mission on a personal level is to really empower business to be a transformative force for good out there in the world. And you're doing some amazing work and I'm looking forward to speaking about it. But before that, could you give us some highlights of what your experience has been like getting that call out of the blue or being contacted for one of those huge career moves? It was interesting, you know, having been living in London with my wife at the time, we thought we'd stay in London and Europe for some time because, you know, pan-European work, all the brands in Europe were, were just fantastic. And then I did get this call to work on Nike and it was strange because I didn't even know where Portland, Oregon was. Quite honestly, I'd heard of Portland, Maine and I thought it must be on the East Coast. It was really out of the blue and my, my wife and I actually sat down on a bus bench in London and sat there and looked at each other and said, are we going to do this? Like, are we going to go and move to the States? We'd never thought of working in the United States. And, you know, I think you're, you're always lucky if you've got a partner who is willing to be up for it and yes. support your career by taking those leaps of faith. But we moved to Portland. We had a three or four month old baby. We didn't know a single person in the United States, didn't it's know a single hard. person in you know, Portland. And we just sort of wondered where the nearest laundromat was and where to find an apartment and life began again. So it's been a journey of sort of reinvention for the last 20 years. Amazing. I traveled a lot. I worked in many countries as well, multiple countries. So I, I can imagine the difficulties of moving, especially with the four months old baby. It is interesting, Chris, because I don't know that people realize it, but it's a reset each time. You've got to find new friends. Yes. You've got to orientate yourself in a city. If you don't have relationships, you've got to start sort of earning that credibility from scratch again. And I think, you know, this dissuades a lot of people. They feel like, you know, it makes things unnecessarily difficult. But if I look back since when I left the Sydney about 25 years ago, I really see it as the, the most valuable gift we gave ourselves because you never really know how far you can go until you constantly stay out of your comfort zone and constantly challenge yourself in your environments. And I'll say even on a personal level, it kept my wife of 27 years, our relationship young, because, you know, you're always discovering a new place. You're making new friends. You're reinventing yourself. I found that to be a really positive experience. I totally agree. And it also makes you a citizen of the world 
as opposed to just one country. I agree. I mean, Australia is an interesting place and Sydney, it's a real melting pot for different nationalities around the world. My mother is Hungarian. She came from Budapest, you know, and my wife is Egyptian. She was born in Alexandria. And then you've got a real melting pot in Sydney. And then our work has taken us around the world. And we've spent a lot of time in the Middle East and time with her family. And that it does make a big, big difference in terms of your perspective. You do see yourself as a global citizen and you come to appreciate that there are different versions of life and different versions of culture. And you become less sort of, um, shall we say, committed or stubborn about the way you live and your version of life because you recognize there are so many others. Absolutely. Let's talk about your amazing work. At V First, you are helping companies work out what to say and how to say it. And you also do culture building work inside companies, the planning, the training, the tools to build that culture, as well as the impact storytelling. Based on being inside of a lot of companies and really helping them foster their culture, what do you think are fundamental shifts that are occurring as a result of COVID and other major changes that are taking place? You know, as someone who's been in the marketing world and worked around the world for the last 30 years, I think the last few years have been absolutely transformative. And I'll tell you why. Firstly, at a baseline level, three things have come together. You've got heightened awareness of the challenges we face, climate, biodiversity, pollution in the ocean and social inequities. You know, they're really on top of mind. They're in the headlines every day. Secondly, we've got younger demographics coming through, millennials and Gen Z who aren't 20 years old anymore. They're in their late 30s, taking over management roles, taking over companies. And they really do look at life through a values based lens. They expect different things from the companies they work for and, and they lead. And then thirdly, you've got social technologies. I mean, we all live our lives through these small screens now and we're so hyper-connected, always on. Those three things together, the awareness, the demographics and the social technologies have changed the business landscape and it's heightened the expectation that business does more good. But to your question, this was given absolute kind of a thrust forward due to COVID. Because in the last 18 months, not only have we all had to endure the fear, anxiety and, and sadness of so much loss, but also we've had, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and social inequities really thrust to the front of headlines around the world. We've also had the climate crisis be top of mind. And suddenly we realize in business that there's a growing and accelerating expectation amongst investors, consumers and employees that business needs to show up in a different way. Everyone knows that the vast majority of companies have contributed to a lot of the problems we're in through their supply chain, or maybe they're treating their people poorly, or they're making products that don't serve the environment. And so now they're looking to buy from, invest in, and work for companies that are doing more good. And so I think COVID in the last 18 months has absolutely accelerated that expectation. Absolutely, could not agree more with you. So building on that, Simon, how can companies build and strengthen their culture? What are some major changes, rituals, traditions companies need to think about introducing to improve their cultures? You know, culture broadly defined is that intangible expression of values inside an organization. People go to work for companies that have a good culture. They feel fulfilled as their whole person inside a culture that shares their values. So how do you build it? Well, firstly, you've got to define your purpose in the first place. And your purpose is why you exist as a company, not what business you're in, not what products you make, but what is your role in the world? For example, Unilever, the largest CPG in the world based out of the UK, their purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. The business they're in is sustainable living or Airbnb, which has a global footprint. Their purpose is to create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. They're in the business of universal belonging. So when it comes to their culture, you've got to define that purpose in the first place and then integrate it internally with your employees upstream in your supply chain to make sure everyone knows why the company exists because that will inform their daily role. That will inspire people to join the company. That will allow you to retain employees for the longer term. And then how do you maintain that over time? In our work with companies of all sizes, large and small, 
there's three different vectors you have to consider. And this is so important because if you don't, what often happens is you make the commitment to being a purposeful company. You make the announcement, but like a balloon, it slowly sinks to the ground. Yes. The way to avoid that is to make sure you do these three vectors, top down, bottom up, and over time. So top down is the CEO, the C-suite, department leads, sharing with the company what you stand for, what is your role in the world, what gets you out of bed in the morning. And this can be an announcement by the CEO, it can be a live event or a virtual event, it could be you know, whatever, the company, whatever company format suits them best. Then secondly, bottom up, you've got to invest time and resources in identifying those stories inside the company by your employees, by your suppliers, by your partners that reflect that purpose and share those stories with everyone else to elevate the importance of your purpose to the same level as your profit so that people know it isn't just a marketing or communications exercise, but rather it's something that's living and breathing inside the company. And then thirdly, over time, you've got to establish these traditions and rituals. So a ritual might be once a quarter, you have an all hands meeting and the C-suite, the CEO, talks to the company and says, look, these are our commitments. This is the difference we're making in communities around the world. These are our ESG commitments, environmental, social and governance commitments. And really just remind everyone what that purpose is and how we're tracking. And then those traditions could be an annual day of volunteering like Starbucks Global Month of Service or Timberland's Path to Service. All of these different companies create an opportunity once a year to really reinvest in what they stand for as an expression of their purpose. So to build a company culture that is purposeful over time, make sure you define your purpose and then you integrate it top down, bottom up and over time. Could you give us some examples of companies that are doing it very well? There are many companies doing this well now. And I think the common denominator is they co-create the impact they want to have with their employees. So I mentioned Timberland. I mean, each year Timberland does its path to service day. They have almost 90% of employees that participate going out there and planting trees. And even above and beyond that, they're now working with artists and influencers to create wallscapes inside urban areas that bring to life their commitment to the environment. Another example might be Starbucks, as I mentioned, where they actually co-create the impact specific to the different region or city you're in around the world. So they have their global month of service and then the employees or what they call partners in each region actually have input into what area or what issue they want to address. And then they all work towards that in locally. And then as an aggregate of that, they talk about the overall impact that the company has had in very different ways in different regions around the world as part of their global month of service. And so one other point on that is one of the most powerful ways that you can bring your purpose to life and really engage your employees and build a productive culture of purpose is to give them different ways to participate because one size doesn't fit all. Not everybody wants to do the same thing. So some people may want to create and share content. Some people may want to volunteer. Some yes. people may want a donation match with their company. You know, so look at the individual human being that is your employee and give them a suite of ways that they can actually participate. And suddenly you'll see the vast majority of your employees show up and they'll really believe that your purpose is authentic and it'll really make them feel better about working at your company. And that will be good for your bottom line. This is such an important point and it also ties back to what I spoke about to Amanda lots yesterday, how it's important to give people control, more control, more choices. So on the podcast with Amanda, we spoke about what happened with media industry, the disruption that it had because of the internet happened in large part because of dissatisfaction that customers had with how things were being done. So they could not buy a single, they could only buy a CD, they could not stream music, they could only own it. And you are bringing up a similar point, but only as it relates to employees, they want to have a choice how they want to contribute, yeah, how they I, want to align I, themselves with the purpose. I, I could not agree more. The big oversight or the big mistake most companies make is that they're prescriptive even when they want to be purposeful. And what do I mean? 
Many times a company will have the best intentions and they'll want to become more purposeful. But then they apply the same mindset that applies to their organizational structure or their supply chain, which is a top-down command and control mentality. But that doesn't work with purpose. You've got to instead turn that upside down and say the company and its foundational purpose is a platform on which all of the employees, your partners, your customers, all stand in an outbound way to make a difference in the world. And so the way to do that is see it as a co-creative exercise, whether that means you ask them what issue or cause you'd like to them to contribute to, you ask them how they'd like to participate, you ask them when an issue comes up, like the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, how they want to respond. When it's co-creative, they're much more invested in participating and achieving the result. Exactly. People support what they create. Agreed. Simon, from your perspective, from all the work that you are doing, what is the future of how business will be conducted? I think that most businesses today, CEOs, C-suite included, are not looking at the world with a clear-eyed point of view. And I think that it's going to cost them dearly. And that sounds grave, but I'll explain why. Too many businesses are failing to realize the reality of the future we face. Why? Because they are building on the past. They are doing a little bit better or a little bit different to the way things always were. But we instead need to reverse engineer out of the future and prepare for that future so that when it is accelerating towards us, you know, the market rises to meet us and we can do well within it. We can leverage the new market forces. And what does that future look like? Today, right now, issues like the climate crisis, loss of biodiversity, ocean acidification, pollution in the oceans, social inequity and disparity of wealth and opportunity are all compounding in the future, all interrelated and complex, but growing and they're hurtling back towards us in the present. And what that's going to do is very soon create a hockey stick of expectation on every business to show up very differently. And I deeply believe the most iconic brands of the future will be those with the greatest social impact. Not because everyone suddenly woke up and grew a conscience, but because the reality of our world is going to be very, very compromised because of the conditions we've created for ourselves. I mean, just look at how the world has changed in the last 18 months. And one of the great challenges to all CEOs, every founder, every CEO right now is, how do you deal with multiple crises at once? From fair and living wage, to diversity and inclusion, to sustainability and ESG expectations, to whatever the next challenge might be, pandemic or otherwise. And so, you know, how do I think business is going to change? What does the future of business look like? I think it's going to look like the shift that we've experienced in the last 24 months, and it's going to continue and it's going to increase. But that sounds negative. If you flip it, if you change your perspective and realize that every single one of these challenges are a marketplace opportunity waiting to be solved, then you can be very optimistic and you can drive enormous growth and unlock incredible opportunity moving forward. So how do we pull carbon out of the air? How do we get plastic out of our supply chains, our oceans, our lives? How do we shore up the communities in which we operate? Because here's the reality, brands can't survive in societies that fail. And the more that we serve those society at large in our communities, the better equipped we will be to thrive. And so the short answer is, I think that we need to reverse engineer out of the future rather than build on the past. It's a very challenged future. And the brands that are going to experience extraordinary growth are the ones who are going to see business opportunity in solving for these social and environmental challenges. So we talked about how you think about the future. What about as far as trends that you are paying attention to? The world is transforming quite a lot. What are some of the big things that are on your radar? I think one of the greatest challenges for us all moving forward is the nature of reality itself. And what do I mean? 
I think here in the United States, it's a very divisive time. People are polarized. But the role of a lot of social technologies and social media in our lives continues to pull people apart. Putting politics aside, the reason that's so important is that we can't even agree on the version of reality that we're living in, let alone solve for it. And I think, you know, there is going to be a watershed moment where we're going to have to start to reorientate how we see each other and our relationship with the natural world if we're going to be able to solve for these big challenges. So I see a big shift coming in terms of the ro role of technology in our lives and reconnection to each other and the natural world in service of a more sustainable future. At the same time, I see that the younger demographics coming through are impatient, they're angry, and they are deeply, deeply committed to transform the way business is showing up in the world. And I think there are going to be companies that are on the right side of history that are really retooling themselves to not only do less bad, but more good and solve for these issues. And there are a lot of companies that will fall off the backside of that wave of change because they're not moving far enough or fast enough. And, you know, these younger demographics coming through, investors, employees, consumers will basically put them out of business because they're simply not relevant to the reality of the future we're all facing. And then finally, I think that we are going to find ourselves increasingly aware of the limits to the natural world that we now find ourselves in and the huge implications that has for humanity at large. I think a growing population, I think the you know, loss of arable land, I think the extreme weather and impact of the climate crisis is going to show up in our lives in very, very dramatic ways, which we're seeing already, you know, with fires in Greece, the floods in Germany, the fires in California, the fires in Australia. And increasingly, we're going to be very, very aware that nature is responding to the conditions that we've created. And we're going to have to create very new conditions if we don't want to compromise our own future. So I think all of these will be coming together and it's potentially going to be the greatest transformation in business since the Industrial Revolution, where we're going to, instead of working against the natural world, we're going to work with it. And I'm incredibly excited about it. Absolutely. So building on top of it, can you share with us your view on why it's important for leaders now to take a stand on certain issues? Why now leaders really need to take a stand? In increasing degree, there seems to be no such thing as neutral anymore. So you've got a choice. You kind of lose everyone on either side of the fence, or you deepen the loyalty of those who are aligned with your beliefs. And then also as a leader, as an organization, you want to show up on the right side of history. You are either part of the problem or you are a part of the solution. So this puts so much pressure on leaders to navigate this new world of having to take a stand and figuring out how to deal with all the negativity that comes from, from the side that would disagree with them. Do you have advice for our listeners on how should they be thinking about this? It's a great question and it's something we face in our work with companies every single day. And here would be my answer. It is either very, very hard for you or it will be very, very easy. What is hard? If you are trying to play both sides of the fence, then you will not only lose the loyalty of those who are committed to your brand, but the people that you want to win over won't believe you either. And at the same time, all of the stakeholders out there, from consumers to employees to investors, now realize that they're not just, for example, someone who buys your product, but rather they're a stakeholder in the future. And if they don't believe that you care about the same things, they will either assume you're part of the problem or they'll go to another brand that is more articulate about the positive role they want to play in the world. The easy side of it is when you make a decision as to what your role is, your purpose, what your values are, what issues you want to speak to, then it's very, very simple. Is this authentic and relevant to your business? If so, how do you want to show up? Do you just want to be an ally for those brands and voices that want to 
lean into this issue? Do you want to be an advocate for change and policy making? Do you want to be an activist and really take an issue on? But as soon as you decide what you stand for and who you are, then everything becomes incredibly simple. And here's the, the big challenge for those who are still sitting on the fence. Inaction is action. Saying nothing says something to everybody. And you know, when you do that, people either assume you don't care about the same things, they assume you don't care at all, or they'll go to a competitor that is more articulate about what they stand for. So if you were to ask me, what should brands stand for today? And then what do they do when something suddenly comes up? I would say the three key issues that every company must address these days are sustainability or ESG, environmental, social and governance, DNI, diversity and inclusion, and fair and living wage. Every company needs, that's table stakes to be in business. Above and beyond that, you then get to choose which issues are most relevant to your brand. And then when you do that, make sure you show up in an authentic way. And I'll, and I'll give you an example during COVID. A lot of companies, to their credit, started making PPE equipment and even ventilators during you know, the initial months of COVID-19 as it broke out all around the world. But for example, there's a, a razor company called Harry's where you subscribe to get razors. And they thought to themselves, okay, what is our key demographic? And it's really young men. And they said, well, in the context of COVID, what's most relevant to that key demographic? Well, there's mental health issues. There's a high suicide rate in young men anyway, and it's got worse during COVID. So what is the most relevant and authentic way that they could show up that still feels very aligned to their brand? And what they did was they partnered with Crisis Text Line here in the United States to really help young men navigate any mental health challenges during COVID-19. So it was something that was specific to their audience. It was relevant to their brand. It was meaningful in the context of COVID-19, but it wasn't what most other brands were doing. So I thought that was an instructive example. It is actually a very good example, thinking about how can you help your customers, clients beyond just your immediate product. This also brings up an interesting point. It's a very controversial topic, cancelled culture. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this because we've seen people feel fearful of saying something because of the backlash that they might get. I know a lot of leaders struggle with this. How do you balance being open and honest and transparent and taking a stand on what you believe in versus the fear of getting canceled and getting all the negativity that comes with making your position known? Because as soon as you put your hand up, there's just so many people who are ready to smack it down. It's very true and it's very challenging for any brand, any public figure these days. I do think at its worst extremes, cancel culture is one of the negative side effects of this sort of polarization created by you know, social media where whether people are anonymous or whether they just you know, make it their sport to criticize others, it can be very extreme. That said, there are legitimate things that a leader of any company can do to help navigate cancel culture. The first thing is to make sure that when you are making a stand for something, women's empowerment, same-sex marriage, gun control, whatever it might be, wherever you are in the world, stay positive. And what I mean by that is once you've defined your purpose and values, if there's an issue that comes up that challenges those values, restate them, lean into them, celebrate them, empower people in and around them, but don't point the finger at others and say they're wrong. Don't criticize others and say their point of view has no validity, but rather stay positive and just double down on what is really authentic to your brand. The second thing you need to do is to control the narrative. As you say, when you put your hand up, it invites scrutiny. And then suddenly you can be exposed for things you're doing well, but also things you're doing not so well. And the way to avoid that is to say, like any company, this is what we're good at, this is our commitment, and this is what we're not doing as well as we could, but this is what we're doing to work on it. And so, you know, by getting out ahead of the issue, whether it's plastic in your supply chain or whether it's any aspect of your business or products that you need to improve, be the one that owns that, 
Share your awareness of that so that it basically takes the opportunity away from others, individuals, media and so on, to really point the finger at you as if you're hiding something. So stay positive, control the narrative, and then thirdly, most importantly, you've got to walk your talk. You know, the reason cancel culture thrives today is not only the technology and the tools themselves, but because there is so much disingenuous behavior, there are so many false claims out there, there is so much purpose washing, cause washing, there is so much unacceptable behavior by leaders in positions of power. And so if you are gonna have a purpose and you are gonna have values, live it authentically and walk your talk. That is the most powerful antidote to cancel culture. I agree, Simon. And what advice would you give to listeners who are not a CEO of a company, but they are maybe senior manager? So we spoke a lot about how companies need to address it. If we go down a few levels and we go to, let's say, manager, senior manager level, what advice would you give them? The wonderful thing about this period in business is that we are really starting to embrace the agency of every single person in society. A consumer can have an impact by what companies it buys from, where they work, where they invest their money in a pension fund. In the same way, an employee, a manager, a couple of levels down can be a catalyst for change. And actually in all the work we've done over the last decade with purposeful brands, typically the transformative work begins when there's a small group of people or an individual inside a company that surfaces up an issue, starts to work on an initiative, gain some momentum behind it, and then the company embraces it. And so if you're an individual inside a company that is purposeful and is already doing this sort of work, I think you take it to a senior manager and so on, and you, you lay out the business case for it. You show examples of competitors that are thinking this way, and you really think through the cost benefit analysis of leaning into a certain cause or commitment. And then you will equip that senior manager or that CEO or C-suite executive to look at it and say, wow, this makes a lot of sense. If you're inside a company that doesn't do this type of work, that doesn't mean that you know, there's no hope. You should take the same approach, which is to go to somebody in a position of influence who you suspect cares about the same things and says, can we explore the idea of doing this and see if they embrace it and you slowly build a, a small group inside the company that are committed to this and then take it to senior leadership and so on. If you only find resistance and you're shut down and there's absolutely no commitment to showing up more positively inside that company, you may want to consider whether that company is the right place for you because you care about these issues and there's no way for you to express that inside the company. And right now, due to COVID, you're seeing what they're calling the great resignation, where a lot of people are thinking about where they're working and whether it was aligned with who they are and actually moving on and changing careers. And so, you know, I think each of us has an opportunity as an employee, as a consumer, as a supplier to show up in a new way. And my hope for everyone is that they're in a, in a company that will embrace that. But even if you're not, run it up the flagpole, see if you can get some sort of buy-in or momentum behind it. And if you're really, if you only find there's resistance and there is no alignment between what you care about and what the company is doing, then it might be good reason to consider where you're looking for a new position. Absolutely. And this, I think, also extends further to even beyond the companies. Even if you are a mom with three kids, you are a leader and you need to lead. I completely agree, Chris. I think for a long time, and I don't mean to generalize, but a lot of us were waiting for somebody else to fix things. Government will fix it, or a nonprofit NGO foundation will fix it, or those do-good companies out there will fix it. But we've, we're all waking up to the realization now that we created this mess together. It doesn't mean we're bad people, but when we're throwing a piece of plastic in the street, when we're buying from a company that's polluting the water, you know, when we're enabling a CEO who is treating his people poorly, all of these things have contributed to this situation we now find ourselves in. But the good news is, if we each realize we have a role to play, whether you're a mum, as you say, whether you're a mid-level manager, you know, whether you're a supplier, if you start to do good, that same connectivity between all of your actions and its effect on other people's actions 
will compound in a positive way instead of a negative way. And that's why I'm so adamant about this whole we mindset is because no one company is going to solve it. No one billionaire is going to solve it. No one industry is going to solve the challenges we face in our future. We're going to have to do it together. And when we do, it's going to be incredibly powerful. But to get there, we're going to have to really get a clear idea of the future and make sure that we are working together and thinking in new ways. Could not agree with you more, Simon. And you are recommending in your book constant collaboration, even across sectors, even with competition. How do we do this without losing our market edge or even worse, our intellectual property? You know, one of the things I talk about in my new book is really about the future of collaborative leadership. And what does that mean? We're not getting far enough, fast enough in terms of solving these issues. You know, in researching the book, I see that we've got 10 or 12 years before these issues, which are already here, like the climate crisis, reach a point of no return. And there's going to be a cascading effect in our lives that is going to change our lives dramatically and certainly the lives of our children. I want to avoid that, in which case, what do we need to do? We need to work together in new ways above and beyond what we've been doing up till now. Even the companies that are doing good have typically done it through the lens of the virtuous cycle, which is do well by doing good. But I think we need to go further, what I call the virtuous spiral, where you actually all different levels inside a company and beyond work together from you, the individual, to the CEO, to the company culture, to the community around the company, out into society, and then really to what I call this idea of sort of transcendent business, where business itself is repurposed through this idea of collectivized purpose. Business has a higher order purpose to restore and renew the living and natural systems on which we depend, but then each company within it plays its own unique individual role. So what does that mean? That means you start to work with competitors in a pre-competitive collaborative way. What does that mean? That means you look at the industry and say, how can we, for example, create less waste? How can we use more responsible dyes in our fabric or clothing? How can we you know, create innovations that the whole industry can use prior to going to market? And then how we use those innovations, how we take them to market, how good our products are, it's all still fair game. This is capitalism at its best. But what you're doing is leveling up the industry through pre-competitive collaboration. And then above and beyond that, as you mentioned, there is cross-sector partnerships and collaboration where the public sector and the private sector work together. And we create those synergies between the different sectors of society, because in the absence of doing that, what you're finding is, oh, consumers want a better type of product, but business isn't making it or business wants to make a better type of product, but governments and regulations don't enable that. Or investors want to invest in companies doing good, but CEOs aren't prepared to make those products. And this competition between the different sectors of society are putting a limit or ceiling on how quickly we can course correct carbon in the air, plastics in the ocean, and so on and so on. And we need to break through that sooner rather than later so that we can course correct our future. Absolutely. Simon, how do you think leadership itself is changing? What do you think is different about what leaders have to start doing now and what leaders are going to need to do in the future? I think leadership has got to be much more empathetic today. And by empathy, I mean you have a strong awareness, sensitivity to the experience of life for others. And on the strength of that, you don't see yourself as this hierarchical leader at the top but rather you're somebody that inspires others to follow you. And in service of what? In service of your purpose, the reason the company exists. And so I see the nature of leadership changing to be much more collaborative. And if you just think about it for a second, it's far easier for somebody to identify a higher order role that a company or an organization is going to play in people's lives in our future and rally everyone around something bigger than yourself than it is to really just talk about making money and be prescriptive and tell people to do their jobs and really not engage their whole human being, don't get them inspired or excited. And that's why you're seeing this great resignation going on right now. 
And so I think we are going to have to lead together in new ways. I think the nature of leadership is going to become much more empathetic. And I think all of us are going to recognize that we need to be leaders. Chris, you need to be a leader through the choices you make in your life. Simon, you need to be a leader in the choices I make in my life. We all need to lead together. And you might say, you know, your listeners might say, how on earth is that ever going to happen? Well, firstly, I want to draw a distinction between healthy self-interest and selfishness. It's fundamental to human nature to have a healthy self-interest. You want to do well yourself, you want to do well for your family, and so on. What I'm talking about is putting an end to selfishness where your success comes at the cost of others. Because now, the way we've been doing business is coming at the cost of things that are far more valuable than money. Our environment, the air we breathe, you know, the water on which we depend. I mean, it's, there's no choice. This, this is the stuff of life. And so we need to be much more conscious of where we're investing our time and what, what the true value or cost of things are through the businesses we make and create. And so all of that is to say that I think leadership moving forward is going to be a collective experience. We're all going to embrace our own agency for change. We're going to be much more collaborative in nature. Why? Because these issues we're solving for are bigger than humanity itself. And just one other point on that, Chris. When you look at COVID, if you go back to February 2020, if we were doing this podcast in February 2020 and I said, you know what, in one month's time, the vast majority of the business world will start to shut down and the vast majority of companies will be preparing to send their employees home and some of the major companies in the world will be retooling their supply chains and making PPE equipment and ventilators and so on and so on. You would have said I'm crazy. But that extraordinary set of events happened because we faced something that threatened us all. And that is just almost like a pilot or a, a preparation for a lot of these challenges that we're going to face in the near term. And as business leaders and as people in business in all the different capacities, we are going to show up very, very differently because we have to if we want to survive and thrive. Yes, it's almost like universe is tapping us on our shoulders and saying that something has to change. It is. I mean, I think I heard somebody say that um, Mother Nature has sent us to our room to think about what we've done. And I get that sentiment. But at the same time, I'm not pessimistic at all. Think about this. All the consequences that we're now dealing with, with climate, with the oceans, with you know, soil degradation and so on and so on, they were all created largely in the span of one human lifetime in the last 80 to 100 years, which is pretty shocking. But at the same time, I think if we engage human ingenuity and we start working together in new ways, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you do more good and I do more good and we make more responsible products and the market forces reward them and consumers will buy from them and more companies do it, we can actually start building a momentum that'll take on a life of its own. And we will suddenly look back and go, what on earth were we thinking? How could we have been destroying the living systems, the natural systems on which our very life depends, and how could we be so degrading our infrastructure, our cities, so that society is breaking down, so that there is no middle class, so that there is no one to buy our products? I actually think it's a rebirth going on right now, not a breakdown. I agree. Simon, what is the number one change that companies of any size must make to be successful in the current environment and going forward? And what do you think will be the major obstacles they will be facing if they will try to implement that change? I think the number one thing every brand has to do is to define its purpose in a differentiated way. So there's two parts to that. The first is you have to be very clear eyed about why you exist as a company. A higher order thing, bigger than your company, bigger than your products, but a reason for existing in the world. That is fundamental and it needs to be done in a differentiated way because as you can imagine and as you see when all of these companies are now talking about their good works or their ESG commitments and so on, it's easy to get lost in the noise, the clutter of all of these brands saying the same thing. And so you've got to really interrogate your own brand to define what you stand for in a way that's going to stand out from your competitors and stand out from the rising number of purposeful brands. 
and it's 100% doable. We do it in our work with all the companies we work with. There is no industry, no company, no product, no category that doesn't create an opportunity for you to have a unique role to play. That's the first thing you've got to do because without that, you don't really have an organizing principle for how you're showing up in the world. The obstacle, I think there's three parts to the obstacle. And I, I always welcome healthy cynicism from anyone <laughs> to people who talk like me about how business can be a force for good. Because, you know, you can't be naive. You can't be Pollyanna about this stuff. There are three forces working against us. All around the world, there are legacy brands and industries that are working against these changes. Why? Because they are making enormous amounts of money from the way things work. And they're very organized. And at worst, they're trying to kind of, you know, create obstacles to change. At best, they're saying they want the change, but they're really not changing behind the scenes. They're just purpose washing. So these big legacy industries and brands don't want things to change. Secondly, we've got in different parts of the global south and in different markets around the world, a large number of people who quite understandably want their day at the banquet table of capitalism. They want their commodities, their products, their goods. You know, they want to thrive in inverted commas the same way they've seen other company, uh, countries thrive. And so there's an aspiration, a middle class, for want of a better term, aspiration to really enjoy you know, the best of excess, shall we say. So they actually want things to stay the same because they want their, you know, their day in the sun. The third piece is, and sadly, this is a the growing vast majority of people around the world that live on dollars a day, the idea of changing what they're doing to improve our future is a luxury they can't even contemplate. They're just trying to survive. They're just trying to get access to clean water. They're just trying to make sure their kids can get educated. They're just trying to survive. And so these three forces, the legacy brands, you know, those people who want the spoils of capitalism and those, you know, who are really just trying to survive, they're three very, very powerful forces that are creating inertia and are working towards keeping the way things are. So I think you need to define your purpose in a differentiated way, but then we need to overcome these very powerful forces. If our listeners want to make the biggest difference in their daily life, both as a person and as an employee, what mindset should they have? What actions can they take starting on Monday morning? You know, the first thing you have to do is choose that you want to lead. You have to choose to be responsible for our future. You have to choose to recognize that every action that you take has an effect, you know, whether it's the brands you buy, whether it's the company you work for, whether it's where you invest your dollars and so on, you have to choose to lead. You have to choose to be part of the solution because otherwise, as things get worse and we reach a point of intolerance and you're, you've got extreme weather destroying your area or there won't be access to clean water or the products that you love won't be available anymore. We will have no one to blame but ourselves. I mean, that is the reality of it all. But then secondly, what can you do on a daily basis on a, on, on a Monday? You can ask yourself, how am I showing up right now? I can do an audit of my life. I'll give you some examples. Am I driving an electric vehicle? There are those electric vehicles now that are less price prohibited. They're not so expensive. Am I driving an electric vehicle? Am I buying products that are very, very conscious of their impact, their carbon footprint, um, their supply chain and, and their role in the world? Like, I, am I supporting with my dollars? Am I voting with my dollars in the shopping aisle every day for companies that are part of the solution rather than part of the problem? And then thirdly, what you can do on a Monday is say, wait a second, what do I care about? What do, I, what do I care about that is relevant to my company's role in its industry, its product category? And ask myself, well, can we do more to make a difference here? Can we organize a way of showing up? Whether it's carving out a percentage of sales to go towards a cause that's aligned with your company, whether it's contributing products, donating products, whether it's volunteering, is there a way that you and your company can be part of the solution? And so I think the simple answer is, to look at your life, all the different hats that you wear, mother, father, daughter, brother, employee, investor, and really see them all as part of, you know, you being a stakeholder in our future and say, hey, how can I put this to work in a more responsible way? And again, if somebody's listening to this and says, well, I get that intellectually, 
but I don't see how it's going to happen. I think people are too lazy, too self-interested, too apathetic. I understand that, but we are running out of time. And the same way that COVID means that we wear masks when we go outside, that there's been social distancing, that travel has been curtailed, that there's been a tragic loss of life all around the world that continues. The consequences of not doing it are going to be that real. And when you make that individual decision, it's not just you that makes a difference, you inspire somebody else to do it. And then more people will do it and it will take on a life of its own. And it'll build momentum and it will increasingly inform market forces. But all of us need to rise to this challenge now because the reality I've been talking about that is coming towards us from the future is going to be very, very difficult to live with if we don't. This is so true. And it is also part of your legacy. Your legacy is every person you ever touched, every person that ever was impacted. And you are so right. You have no idea how many people will become much more purpose-driven if you are purpose-driven. It's so true. I could not agree more. You know, a lot of people have gone almost from apathy where they didn't care about what business was doing to hopelessness. Oh no, the future's lost and they've given up. But I think in that gap is the most important and powerful piece, which is we are innately good people. Innately, we want to connect to each other. Innately, we want to connect to the natural world. It's hardwired into our brains, into our chemistry. And I think we need to get closer together to each other, closer to the natural world, and realize that if we actually reprioritize how we live, then we can have a very different experience of life. I mean, you see cities like Barcelona talking about green zones now. You see cities shutting down congestion and traffic in different ways. You see a flight of capital all around the world to ESG funds, which are you know, companies that are more responsible in terms of sustainability. You see Larry Fink, the biggest, the CEO of the biggest money manager in the world, talking about the social purpose of business. You see B Corps out there. You see the Business Roundtable, the largest companies in the world, their CEOs all talking about a redefinition of the role of, of business and companies. There is enormous momentum building right now to solve for our future. And we've all just got to ask ourselves, do I want to be a part of that? Do I actually feel like if we all put lock arms and we do this together, we can make a difference? And if so, start small and build from there. And suddenly you don't feel hopeless. Suddenly when you're intentional about everything you buy and how you show up in the world, you go, wait a second, everything I'm doing is part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And then you don't feel hopeless because you are already being an agent of change. Yes. And every crisis is an opportunity. So yes. it's important not to let it go to waste. And I love that you are optimistic about the future. I think we really need it right now. Simon, what excites you about the future? You know, there's a funny old thing about that. What excites me about the future is that there's several things coming together that people don't seem to give enough attention to. Number one, I have never seen so much awareness of the challenges we face around climate or plastics in the ocean or loss of biodiversity. People are aware in a way that was unimaginable five years ago and COVID has caused that in a lot of ways. Secondly, we've got younger demographics coming through who are extraordinary, who look at the world differently and want to make a difference. That's their way of being in the world. And then thirdly, we've got exponential technologies, social technologies, AI, all of these different tools that can create change in ways that really weren't possible before, that can go to scale in ways that you know, are just breathtaking. I also deeply believe that humanity has a strong survival instinct. I don't think we want to go out of business. I think we're probably foolish enough to leave it as late as we can go before we actually fix what we're doing. But I do believe in the strong survival instinct on an individual and collective level. I also think that there's a movement underway, specifically around the climate crisis. As you see all the announcements and there's you know, COP26, the big climate conference happening and so on. You know, all of these people, best of breed people, financial institutions, heads of state are rallying in ways that you haven't seen before. And then finally, you know, I believe that doing good is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what do I mean? 
If we all give up, there is no chance because we've all given up. It's just self-evident. But if we actually believe that we can make a difference and we take small actions and we have small wins and they build and more people do it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it is true and more people do it and the market forces reward it and so on and so on and so on. And the last thing I'd say is this, anyone who feels hopeless or anyone who feels like, what's the point of trying? Here's the truth. We have never even tried yet and we're already giving up. We have never tried to repurpose business to do good at scale. We have never tried to re-engineer our supply chains to stop destroying the natural world. We have never tried to really leverage our agency in all aspects of our life to make better choices. We have never tried to reward companies in the stock markets around the world for the good they're doing rather than just making money. We have never tried to do this all together. And so how on earth can we give up when we haven't even tried? And so if we really shoulder to shoulder lean into this in the next decade to solve for these issues, then, and it doesn't work, then maybe I'll start to get a little bit cynical. But I deeply believe that this is an absolutely transformative reimagining of business going on right now. And as people get a taste of the marketplace opportunity by solving for these issues that challenge our future, and it takes on a life of its own, we're going to see it build momentum. And we honestly, we're going to look back in a decade or two and say, what on earth were we doing before this? Because look at how much potential there is in solving for these social and environmental issues. So in essence, I don't believe we've even tried. And I think when we do try, it's going to be extraordinary what we can do. Simon, I so agree with you. And what do you think is the biggest mistake companies must avoid if they want to make a difference in shaping culture and be part of this better future? I think they need to be genuine about it. You know, paying lip service to being purposeful, you know, just managing the optics by putting a nice campaign or television ad out there anywhere in the world, that is only going to do more harm than good to you. You'd be better off not doing anything at all. Because as these issues become more and more acute, your employees, your investors, your customers or consumers will become more and more intolerant of companies that simply, almost cynically, say they are purposeful and then don't really change. And we're at a point now, and it's already being experienced by so many people around the world. You've got climate refugees, you've got huge disparity of wealth, you've got infrastructure breaking down in cities all around the world, not to mention COVID. You're already seeing people waking up to just how irresponsible we have managed our lives, the environment, society, business, and that it has to change. And I don't think there's going to be much compassion for companies that don't do it authentically. So the biggest challenge or the biggest mistake would to be just pay lip service to it, to just spin up a, a report or say good things without actually investing the real time and real capital in doing things differently. Simon, and as companies are taking genuine action, storytelling is, of course, becoming very important because this is how our brains are wired. How do the marketing, advertising, and sales departments have to change the story they are telling customers? And also, what about leaders? How should they change the story? How should they use storytelling? I mean, storytelling is so important because it doesn't matter where you are in the world, we are all still human beings sitting around a campfire telling stories. Telling stories about a company, about a CEO, about a product, about a brand. Storytelling is how we relate to each other. But the CEO needs to tell a story that is an expression of this larger shift in storytelling around business. In the 80s and the 90s, greed is good, you know, and everybody wanted to make money at the cost of everything else. But now we're looking at natural capital, like the cost to the environment of what we're making and so on. So the CEO needs to tell a new story about the role of their company in this larger vision of capitalism or business, which is really about collectivized purpose, where every company has a purpose that's going to improve lives, that's going to restore the living systems, the natural systems, the social systems on which we depend. 
In terms of marketing, there are several things that companies need to get right. They need to lead with their purpose in terms of the role they're playing in the world. They need to be the celebrant, not celebrity of their stakeholder community. What do I mean? Too many purposeful companies talk about themselves and nobody listens because they're talking about themselves. Instead, you need to celebrate your suppliers, celebrate your employees, celebrate your customers, celebrate your partners, and use your storytelling, your marketing to celebrate the efforts of stakeholders, A, so they look at the content because it's about them, and B, so they share it. And that way they will build your business with you. But you might ask, why is this possible now when it wasn't possible before? And what's the role of story within that? I want to share this because I'm equally sort of cynical and skeptical of anything that says that we can fix this as anybody else. And the reason I think it's possible now is three things have come together which have never coexisted before. The first is stakes, like the stakes of everything. I mean, we are literally facing an existential crisis. If you look at the IPCC climate report, the sixth assessment that came out that talked about its code red for humanity, we are at a point of no return. The stakes could not be higher. Yeah. Secondly, stakeholders. We could never really offer a viable alternative to the practice of capitalism until we had everyone at the table. Sometimes we had conscious consumers. Sometimes we had a few CEOs. Sometimes we had a few well-intended companies. But most importantly, in the last 18 months, the investor class has woken up. The institutional and retail investors who are saying we want to invest in ESG companies that are more responsible in terms of sustainability and that are you know, demonstrating regenerative practices. So now we have suppliers, CEOs, employees, customers, consumers, and investors, and we finally have everyone at the table. So stakes, stakeholders, and then to your question, story. I don't think we've ever seen a moment in time where so many voices from all different sectors are calling for a new story for business, a new narrative around the role of business in the world. And I mentioned some of the examples before, but the larger point is this, when you have the stakes, when you have the stakeholders and you have a new story, then we can all be human beings sitting around a campfire, repurposing business in ways that are going to improve everybody's life. And I think that's the great opportunity. Could not agree more with you. Simon, what are the key takeaways you would like our listeners to walk away with after listening to this episode? The first key takeaway is there is no need to be hopeless. If we all to choose to lead together and to really take responsibility for the impact of our own individual lives, whether that's as a citizen, as an employee, as a CEO, as an investor, whatever it might be, there is nothing we can't achieve together. Secondly, there is a fundamental need for a repurposing of business, a collectivized purpose for business. And I articulate that as sort of leading with we, which is about protecting the natural systems, the social systems on which all of our futures depend. And then thirdly, we must define our purpose and execute it authentically. We need to leverage the power of business, its expertise, innovation, resources, reach, storytelling, marketing, to redirect the way that we're all showing up in the world. And when we do that, business can become this transformative force for good and the market forces will reward companies doing it. And then we'll start to see that we can scale and accelerate our response to these challenges we face. And we'll be able to better meet those timelines that are contracting towards us from the future. Well, Simon, let people know where can they learn more about you, your book, anything that you want to mention, please feel free to do so. Thank you. My new book is called Lead with We, the business revolution that will save our future. And it really lays out a step-by-step -step programmatic approach for how you can pull this idea of leading with we through your entire company, your supply chain, your products, your innovation, your industry, and across sector. And to really position you to be on the right side of history and benefit and drive growth through the market forces that I see coming our way. So this is about driving growth by solving for social and environmental challenges. 
And you can find out about the book at leadwithwe.com, leadwithwe.com. There's lots of information there, or you can pre-order it now on Amazon. And, you know, I would love everybody to really take it to heart, bring it to life in their own individual way and recognize that there is a reimagining of business going on that is going to transform our future. And if you play a part in that, the market forces are going to reward you for doing so. Not because we just want it to be that way, but because of the reality of the world we now live in. There is no alternative and the book will provide a roadmap for how you do that. Simon, thanks again for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a real privilege to get to share some thinking with everyone and wherever you are in the world, let's lead with we together. Well, thanks everyone again for tuning in. My guest again has been Simon Mannering. Make sure to check out his brand new book. It's called Lead with We, and I'll see you next time.